Hi, I'm Simon Drew, and you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to find more episodes of the show, as well as articles and information about my one-on-one alignment coaching, then you can head to my website. It's simonjedrew.com. If you do have the means to support the show, then I'd love to see you in my Patreon community. Just go to patreon.com forward slash simonjedrew, where you'll also get access to over 240 episodes recorded before 2020. But for now, enjoy the show. Hey everyone, thank you so much for spending your time here listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, today I've got a really fascinating guest for you all, uh, none other than Matthew Stoller. Now, I first heard Matthew when he was featured in an interview on Rising with Crystal and Saga um, on YouTube, and uh, and I thought, man, this guy's so fascinating. He's got such an extensive knowledge uh, of, of current events and United States politics, and, and I've been really fascinated with everything that's been going on lately in America, uh, because I think it has real implications on, on the future of humanity, uh, of course. But um, yeah, so I had a really interesting conversation with him today. Uh, spanning a wide array of topics. But uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Matthew, and then we're going to jump straight into the interview. So Matthew Stoller, he is the author of Goliath, the Hundred Year War Between Monopoly, Power, and Democracy. And he also writes a newsletter called Big, and you can find the link to this newsletter in the show notes. Now, previously, Stoller was a senior policy advisor and budget analyst to the Senate Budget Committee. He also worked in the United States House of Representatives on financial services policy, including Dodd-Frank, the Federal Reserve, and the foreclosure crisis. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Republic, Vice, and Salon. He lives in Washington, D.C. And I now present to you my interview with Matthew Stoller. Okay, so here with Matthew Stoller. Now, Matthew, I, I just want to start by saying, you know, obviously there's so much going on in America right now, even around the world. Um, we're dealing with all kinds of, uh, all kinds of problems. But um, I, I want to give you the opportunity from the start of this interview just to introduce yourself um, and maybe tell me a little bit about what led you down the road to getting into politics, what was so interesting about it, for you, or, or at least, you know, journalism about politics and monopolies and, um, and uh, where to from here? Yeah, so uh, my name is Matt Stoller. And I, so sorry, let me start over. That's so my good. name is Matt Stoller. And I wrote a book called Goliath, the 100 year war between monopoly power and democracy, which is a history of monopoly power in uh, standard in the United States in the 20th century, although it's a global story. And I wanted to basically explain why the Obama administration, I'm a Democrat, um, I sit on the left, and I wanted to explain why the Obama administration had been so deferential to concentrated corporate power, both in the form of financial institutions like large banks, but also large technology companies, large agribusiness companies, and so on and so forth. And so what I did is I, I did a bunch of research to figure out why we had done that, what, what happened. I, I worked in Congress as a staffer during the financial crisis and afterwards, and I was constantly running into well-meaning people who were not corrupt, that were making decisions that were harmful and that were deferential to concentrated financial power. So I wrote this book, uh, which is a history of, of ideas. And it's the, the people that I was running into who were making these decisions were doing it because they had learned a certain history about the world and they had a certain set of ideas which involved being highly deferential to corporate power as a way of, of sort of making the world a better place. They looked at corporate power, corporate elites, economists, and they said, oh, th- those are scientists who know what they're doing. And that, that's a very bizarre way of seeing the world, or at least it seemed like an unusual or strange way of seeing the world. And so I wanted to understand where that came from. So the result is this book, Goliath, which is a history You know, it basically tracks one particular congressman named Wright Patman, who's not famous today, but was very famous in his day from 1929 to 1976, and how he fought monopolies, how he fought big banks, where he won, where he lost, 
So that was, that's the gist of it. And today I write a newsletter, it's called Big, which I write about the politics of monopoly and finance. I've written about the Australian uh, competition enforcers. Um, I'm not sure if that's the, an answer to your question, but that's who yeah. I am. That's what I do. Absolutely. And what I, what I find really interesting about your story is, is you are a Democrat. And it, instead of kind of just getting in line and, and supporting the party line, uh, you actually saw a problem within the party, which was that they were supporting almost the very people who you probably would have hoped that they wouldn't be supporting. And you decided to do something about it, right? Was this, was this out of a sense of duty, just curiosity? What, what was it that, that made you think, you, you know, cause you don't see like a lot of young people considering those options today of maybe I should go out there and actually talk about it and do something about the fact that my party isn't working for me. Yeah, I mean, I think I was just curious, you know, there's a lot of people that are frustrated with their own political party. I mean, in the Democratic side in the US, you know, you have a lot of people that are angry with the Democrats. And that's true on the Republican side as well. But mm. what you don't have is a is a real critical frame for the Obama administration. And I think that like you see, he's a very popular guy, he's beloved all over the world. Um, but he was a really bad president. And a lot of the people who made that claim on the right were doing it in bad faith. They didn't really understand the policy details. Some of them were racist, but it was really about uh, acquiring uh, power. That was the, where, their, where their criticism was coming from. It wasn't coming from an empirical study of what those, his policies actually were. And you also have some people who, who make arguments around foreign policy, which is not my area, drone bombings and things like that. And I'm sympathetic to those, but that's not what I studied. I wanted to look at the core political economy questions and just see what did these guys think and why did they make the decisions that they made? And the difference between the critique that I'm making and I think most of the critiques on the democratic side is that I actually believe that the Obama administration largely accomplished what they wanted to accomplish and that what they wanted to accomplish was harmful, not because they were bad people, but because they had bad ideas. And those ideas were about concentrating corporate power and then regulating it, redistributing it to the rest of the population through taxes and spending and social welfare and things like that, instead of preventing the accretion of that power in the first place. There's a specific mm -hmm. ideological choice and it was a bad choice, but it was a specific ideological choice. And I don't think you see really, you, you know, the critique of Obama that you do see is, oh, he wasn't old enough or, he was corrupt and sold out, whatever you want to, like, whatever you want to see, you know, you can, however you want to characterize it. But there's very rarely, a, a, sometimes you see the argument, I think the socialists have an argument, they're like, oh, well, he just believed in capitalism. Um, and capitalism has this inherent, you know, sort of logic. And, you, you know, he never really challenged that logic. Um, and all of those critiques are ones I don't agree with. I, I just look and I'm just like, oh, there are, he just saw certain ways of structuring markets and helped structure markets in those ways because he thought that would be the right way to do things. Same with Guy Tim Geithner, Larry Summers, a lot of the, you know, the international, um, a lot of the international economic policy people. And this is a global, global movement. I mean, you have neoliberals in Australia, you have, you know, neoliberals all over Europe. I mean, they, they're, they're, they have a moral vision about the kind of world they want to create. And it's a moral vision that I think creates chaos, but I want it to be, uh, I wanted to really look at that moral vision and look at the policy consequences of it instead of, you know, making a, an exhortation. And that to really understand that worldview, you have to go back to when it was created, which was in the, you know, the early 1900s. And it was created by uh, basically by Teddy Roosevelt. And, uh, and there was a debate over how to structure corporate power in the election of 1912. And that's when it started. And then that debate went through the, the 1920s and the New Deal, and then going all the way up into World War II was a big part of that debate. And then going up all the way into the, you know, you, where you saw the breaking of the robber barons in the 1930s and 40s and the defeat of the Nazis. So there was sort of a global fight over how to organize industrial power. And then uh, what happened up until the 1970s when you had the, the what the French called the Tente Glorieuse or the, the 30 years of just sort of prosperity, right? Mm. 
why, why that existed, the political economy framework of that era, which was based on decentralizing corporate power, and then why that changed in the 1970s, which was really an, a, an intellectual attack. And we're still, you know, of the counterculture, and we're still in that moment when the counterculture, the this, this sort of like concentrated, deferring to concentrated power, a very new agey form of, of politics in which the politics of personal liberation and, uh, and, and personal consciousness that is more important than, um, than resources and market structure and, you mm. know, and resource distribution. So we're still in that era, we're leaving that era, but to really understand why you would concentrate power in the hands of Google, you have to understand where the ideas behind Google came from, which, which are, are, you know, they came from the counterculture. And those are the yeah. same ideas that are influencing the elite Democrats and influencing, I think, you know, and Republicans too, and people all over the world. Of yeah. And this is something I want to get into later on as well as this idea of, you know, the two parties pretty much working for the same people or the same kind of people uh, and giving us kind of this, this false choice. But um, I, I, I've got kind of a two part question for you based on that. So firstly, I find it really interesting and effective to think about things in the way that you kind of said there, which is um, it's almost, you don't necessarily have to attribute to malice what can simply be attributed to a bad idea or, or maybe a lack of understanding around what's actually happening and how the results of your policies, um, particularly, as you said, in the, in the Obama administration. Um, so, so I guess my two part question is, uh, how much do you think we can attribute uh, our current crisis around the world, whether it is economic or whether it is um, to do with the COVID uh, uh, outbreak um, or anything that's happening in America, really, how, can, how much can we attribute um, government mishaps to uh, malice and how much can we attribute to just a lack of understanding? Um, and then the second part of that question is, you mentioned that, you know, we're kind of leaving an old age of thinking and ideas into a new one. What do you think is the new direction that we're going? Right. So, so the old model, I should say the sort of the neoliberal model, I, I think it's largely intellectual. I think it's an intellectual error, not malice. In, in a lot of ways, you know, sometimes people think I'm really naive to, to believe that the, that political parties are, you know, full of people that believe things. They're like, oh, people are just bought off and, you know, there's all this malice going on. And I'm, my view is it would be way easier to solve if it was just malice, if it was just corruption. You know, it's super easy to deal with that. You just mm. kind of plug it up. The much harder problem is what happens when you have a democracy and people in that democracy want these ideas, right? I think my, you know, one of the reasons I've sort of broken from certain parts of the left is when I looked at Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren who were the candidates on the left of the Democratic Party, you know, they didn't, you know, and I was, I, I liked Warren at some points, I liked Bernie at some points, but, um, but fundamentally, the, um, uh, they didn't lose because they were, you know, Biden was corrupt or anything. They lost because their ideas weren't popular, right? The Democratic Party voters did not like their ideas. They preferred mm -hmm. Biden's ideas, you know. I am a very critical, I'm very critical of Obama, but I'm under no illusions that my ideas are necessarily the ones that voters want. I think they could want them if you were to do some organizing and explain the problem more. And fundamentally, I want to change, I want to win these battles of ideas, which I, I wrote this book. I'm a populist, I believe in public education, but I, I do think that, um, you know, it, it's a much harder problem when you have a country that is, you know, where, where the public gets what they want. And I, and that what, what they want is not what you want. And I think that that's like where a lot of the disagreement is, you know, this, this sort of attempt to explain things as malice when it's, it's actually much scarier to really internalize that maybe the country doesn't want what you want. Maybe there isn't, it's not a useful idiots problem. It's just that you're a minority. You're, mm. yeah, I, mean, I don't mean you're an ethnic minority. I mean, you're just a minority in the population as to what, or in the party as to what you want. And strategically, I think the choices that you make when your ideas are not the most obviously picked by the population, the strategy you have to pursue is different than if you are, ideas are popular, but they're not getting through the political establishment. And they're just different strategies. And I've always seen the, um, you know, I, I, you know, I think you can see, 
I think you could see both of them at work in various points, but I'm not somebody who just assumes that my ideas are really popular. I think they're right, but I don't think that they're necessarily uh, popular. I mean, what's your, um, mm. I forgot, I think I kind of wandered off from your question, but what was your, what was your question? No, that, that, that was absolutely, it's, it's kind of like, what, which direction do you think we're going? Or, you know, you, you, you could right. be answering that by saying where we are. I mean, well, I mean, the, look, the old pro, the old neoliberal paradigm is that power doesn't exist. Right, mm. that everything's about voluntary market exchange. Therefore, power is not a thing. When we, you know, monopolies don't exist because they're irrational. Because no one would ever use power, market power, to abuse other people. It's just it, you. You always just want to maximize profits. And so, why would you forego sales to one entity just to hurt them and monopolize a market? Obviously, if you even monopolize the market, Wall Street would just fund a competitor instantly. Right? There is no such thing as power. There is no such thing as these social organizing. Um, bodies that, that collude. That's not a thing. That doesn't happen. And similarly, you would see that with, um, you know, if you open up uh, unfettered trade with China and you export, you know, you offshore factories, it would be irrational for China to ever use that power in a way that was, um, uh, that was problematic for the United States because power doesn't exist, right? Or, or Australia, and you guys are having a big problem with China right now. Mm. It, that's, that, that, the, there was a naivete uh, and a naive taste, somewhat cynicism, somewhat corruption, but just a basic like lack of, of um, uh, a, a basic inability to think through uh, any dynamic where there's power, right? Market power. I mean, they believe in military power, but not market power. Um, and that's, so now we're in a, in a moment, you know, we haven't seen market power for 40 years. And so we've allowed all of our policymakers to consolidate you know, to allow the consolidation of power in a massive institutions like Google or Amazon or Facebook or Walmart, you know, go down the line. And that's ultimately what Obama believed. He was just like, oh, power is not a thing. Let them all concentrate. It, they're just more efficient. That's why they're mm -hmm. bigger. Um, or, or China, you know, like let them accumulate lots of productive capacity that we might need. You know, who cares? You know, the world is flat. You know, everything just flows instantly. And now all of a sudden we're waking up to a world in which Everyone's like, oh my gosh, power does exist. These institutions are really important and they make political choices and China has lots of leverage. And so now how we respond to that, I mean, you know, you could go in really authoritarian directions. You don't have to go, you know, there's no happy ending here necessarily. I mean, you could go in very egalitarian directions that are, that really liberate us. Um, you know, China is making a really big play for geopolitical power. And it's a, the West is particularly weak, both morally and, and economically right now. So it's not clear to me where any of this goes, but I do mm. think that, you know, we are waking up to a world in which power is a real thing and we have to figure out what our framework is to, to, to wield power. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really, that's, it's, it's such interesting stuff. And what I think is, is particularly, uh, um, I don't know whether it's exciting or whether it's horrifying or somewhere in between, but uh, you point out that, um, you know, a lot of what's happening right now, we've actually voted for America's actually voted for. They, they wanted these ideas or these people in. And, right. and so the way that I kind of think about politics, especially in America is it's kind of like a play. You've got the actors on the stage. Those are the politicians um, you've got the people behind them, maybe the directors, the stagehands, that's big corporations, you know, basically having their influence. But then you've got the audience and that's all of us. Um, and, and in many ways, I have felt as though many of the problems which we have in terms of divisions in, in America and in the world are a direct result of the audience because this is what we want. And if we want what they give us, then they're just going to give us more of that. And the way that I've kind of come to that is, you know, you jump on YouTube and all that you see is like Trump slams the Democrats or, you know, Nancy Pelosi slams Trump. It's like constant um, back and forth battling kind of videos. And, and I can recognize in myself that even I want to watch that sort of stuff. I love that kind of conflict. Right. So, so what do you think is that balance? Is it more the audience than the, than the actors? Is it, what do you think? Well, I don't have an answer to that question. So, so you're, I think that that question is sort of conflates two different points. One is mm. that does, is it true that the public wants what they're getting? Right. Mm. And then the second question is to what extent is polarization, you know, a, a foundational aspect of our politics and why? Yes. And those are different questions. Mm. So I think that the public 
and they, and I think it's kind of confused, right? Because there are different groups of the public. So if you look in American politics, and I think, by the way, this is true all over the world. I mean, France elected mm. Macron, um, England and Brexit, like they're, it's pretty much a mess everywhere, except mm. for China and Russia, they have their own thing going on. But like, this is, you know, India has Modi, like, <laughs> this is not a uniquely American problem. This is a problem of neoliberalism, writ, writ broadly. So, you know, I think one thing that's strange in the U.S. is that the Democratic Party voters want something different than most Americans generally. And so they, they have a, a Democratic uh, Party voters, you know, they, they tend, you know, they're older than the average American. They're usually wealthier. They're um, majority white, but, but a large percentage of them are, are older and black in the South, uh, they have specific, they have specific views. They really like the Democrats, right? Democratic primary voters like Democratic leaders. Mm -hmm. um, that's why they're Democratic primary voters. A lot of the traditional Democratic primary voters that used to be Democrats, who were, you know, workers in the Midwest, have left the Democratic Party. They're not voting in the primaries anymore because they're no longer in part of the party. And so the party is really restructured. Then you had a lot of the Bush administration were Republicans, like the, um, the never Trumper types, who were basically suburban wealthy white people that like low taxes and war, they've become Democrats. So you have a, a different Democratic Party than existed 20 years ago, 30 years ago, mm. 40 years ago. And it's not necessarily, they don't necessarily want the same things that the rest of the public wants. You also have a different Republican party. So it's not clear to me, you know, it's not always clear to me what the public wants, but it, if there is one thing that they do want, it is, uh, it is it's some sort of change. Um, so there was a change election in 2006, in 2008, in 2010, in 2014, in 2016, in 2018. It looks based on the polling that there will be another one in 20. 20 so people are unhappy my sense is that there is a general desire for a different kind of political economy but there's also an incredible fear that any one person will be a loser in the next political economy because if you lose in our society it's a long way down doesn't matter if you're rich it's a long way down if you're poor it's a long way down so there's a mm -hmm. both a desire for a more a different society but also an incredible fear that you will be one of the losers in the next society. So, so people are scared. They want change, but they're scared. And that's why things seem pretty incoherent and, uh, and chaotic. Um, in terms of the polarization, I mean, you mentioned YouTube. The reason they're showing polarizing content is because that's how they make money. So mm -hmm. a lot of the institutions, the media institutions that we rely on, they basically profit by selling ads against clickbait. And that's because of a specific regulatory model of no anti-merger rules, intrusive surveillance, no privacy rules, and the, the specific online behavioral targeted advertising that they, that they have um, organized. So Google and Facebook basically organize all internet advertising and now increasingly all advertising. And if you want to play in their sandbox, if you want advertising, then you have to sell content that is addictive, that is polarizing, and then they sell ads against that. And sometimes they will mm -hmm. cut you in on that. And YouTube is a good example because, you know, they recommended Alex Jones 15 billion times, right? Just to, because Alex Jones was compelling content, even though it was false yeah. and incendiary and often uh, conspiracy theories, but they make money selling ads against that. So, you know, and then you can look at cable news. There's a whole bunch of media, you know, if it, mm -hmm. the expression here is if it bleeds, it leads. Like this is not new, but the platforms have made it a lot worse. So I don't necessarily think that when you see polarizing content on TV or online, that it represents what people really think. I think it represents a particular business model that incentivizes that kind of content. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that I don't, I don't see us getting out of easily anytime soon it's like ever since the internet started i mean people have been incentivized to be more and more sensationalist to their team 
you know, because that's literally what leads people. I mean, that's, that's the algorithms of Google, right? That's the algorithms of all these social media platforms. It's, it, it will show you, uh, you know, the most sensationalist thing that will appeal to you immediately, right? Well, I'm not an inep- I, I'm not going to necessarily agree that it's inevitable. So, so there mm-hmm. was an internet before Google and Facebook. Um, yeah. And there was certainly an internet that was before they were dominant, right? So if you go to the internet of 2008, it looks a lot different than the internet of today. And the internet of 2008 was not very polarizing. And the internet of today is. Now, mm. as an example, you can even look at today. You don't see the same level of polarization on, say, podcasts that you do on written internet content or on YouTube, right? You just don't because yeah. the market structure for podcasts is different. It doesn't rely on, on uh, surveillance and clickbait advertising. It relies on what's called contextual advertising. So if you have a big audience and you are, you are selling and you're a podcaster, you advertisers will go to you directly or they will go to an ad network and they say, I want to sell you know, on the practical stoic podcast, or I want to sell on Joe Rogan, they're selling to an audience, they're not selling to an individual who's surveilled. And, um, and so it's contextual advertising as opposed to clickbait advertising. They're not tracking you, they're just they're talking to you as 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 an audience. And that and we could, Mm. that's, that's only because of specific market structure. So if we wanted to get back to that older, better um, internet, it wouldn't be that hard, we know how to do it, all you need to do would be to essentially take apart the, the dominant platforms, Facebook and Google, so that they're small enough that they can be regulated and that there aren't really conflicts of interest in their business model, and then just ban that clickbait targeted advertising. And then what would happen if you did that is that everybody would move over to contextual advertising and the rest of the internet would start to look more like the podcast space. So it would be healthier, people would make money based on building trusted audiences instead of making money with, you know, polarizing uh, clickbait, often racist or, or, you know, incendiary type of type of stuff. You know, they would, they would make money by building trusted audiences instead of by like, you know, basically creating digital, digital mobs. Mm. Yeah, no, that, that, that's an interesting point. I, I think that that's absolutely fair. And and I'm really interested to find out more about like where you think we could go as opposed to just where we are as well. And I mean, in, in, uh, in Australia, you guys have Rod Sims, right? And he's, he's kind of leading the world right now in terms of thinking about how do you regulate these platforms, right? So, so in Australia, something like 20% of your journalists have been laid off in the last couple of years purely because mm-hmm. of revenue declines from platforms. So Rod Sims... Uh, Australian Competition and Consumer Protection, something, one of the agencies or something, he had a report out like last year that, you know, went into in depth into how Google and Facebook organized the Australian media market, both their advertising and their referrals and how they control traffic. They had a whole bunch of different ideas about what to do. I don't think they were aggressive enough, but really, you know, trying to think through how do you structure a healthy media market? So, you don't, you know, you guys are leading the world in, in this in this moment. And I, I think that that's something I know that a lot of people all over the world are paying attention to in terms of Google, Facebook and monopoly powers, what Rod Sims is doing. Mm. And it's definitely, you know, down to the fault of people like myself that, that maybe they don't get the attention that they deserve because I'm obsessed with American politics. I think everyone is at the moment. It's like, you know, what's going on in America is just so, uh, so interesting because, what happens in America, well, I think, feeds out into the world, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's also where, like, we have the, um, it's the psychodrama that everybody's paying attention yeah. to. And it, like, yeah. you know, and, you know, the U.S. is the most powerful country in the world. It's the country that, for better or worse, um, I think for better and after World War II, but since the 1990s for worse, really structures the, the moral and um, political and military and diplomatic institutions in the world and people are trying to figure out what to do and it's been really bad for us i mean the u.s has mm-hmm. really suffered by being in this hegemonic position it's not you know most people who think about america as a hegemon think about america as a hegemon as a bad thing uh, particularly on the left um the ones who don't think of it as a bad thing tend to be quieter or they're in the financial services industry or, or whatnot but the reality is, as a hegemon, America has been good for elites all over the world and very bad for the American middle class. 
So mm. lifespans have been declining for a while. And that's not a, and you know, there's lots of other problems, obesity, all sorts of other problems, which, which have happened under both political parties. And that's really a function of, of some very deep rooted structural problems in our, in our global financial system that we're going to have to address in, you know, ultimately there will have to be some sort of renegotiation of America's place in the world because this, mm. this system is bad for the U S the American people. It's bad for people all over the world. It's good for Germany. It's good for China. It's good for some countries, but fundamentally like the U S isn't going to have it anymore. And people look at Trump and they're like, this is outrageous. This unilateral, this guy's racist, authoritarian, whatever. He's like discrediting America. But what's really, and that's true that, you know, Trump is really bad for America and everything. And we need to do something about China and that's going to happen through a, a global alliance. But the reality is what Trump is, is a recognition that Americans are not going to pay for this global system anymore. And it is a global system. And I think that's really hard to get your head around because it, it doesn't, fit neatly within either a left wing or a right wing like framework, right? You just, it just doesn't quite work because then you have to acknowledge that, you know, a lot of the blood, the bloodshed that America has pursued, which was unnecessary or necessary, however you want to see it, was part of a, it was a, a global system that, you know, that endorsed that. I mean, it was the Italians that wanted the U.S. and the French that wanted the U.S. to go into Libya, right? Mm. That wasn't like, you know, that wasn't just the U.S., right? There were a lot of these dynamics where, you know, the, 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 our allies were like, how dare you surveil the whole world? You know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's, there's not, this is not, this is like the, one of the reasons American politics is so, I think, appealing in terms of people to, to watch why, is because it allows people to sort of offload their own problems onto yeah. kind of like hegemon, but like, yeah, you know, there. This is kind of like a, you know, we're all we're all a little bit indicted for this one, right? Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. That's a really interesting way to think about it. I can definitely see how I have thought about it like that in the past. And I, I wanted to jump over to your area of expertise and interest, uh, of monopolies. Obviously, I think that there's so much happening around the world right now to do with that monopolies, like uh, something that my um, there's a reg there's a historian who regularly comes on my show, Professor Joseph Syracuse. Something that he says about human nature is, the powerful will always do what they can, and the weak will always do what they must. Right? That's kind of the story of humanity. Um, so dealing with monopolies, it's almost uh, it's a question of what can the powerful do, which is what they're doing. Right? Uh, what is it that with a year like this, when you've got so much civil unrest at the moment, you've got um, you know, you've got the COVID uh, disease, you've got economic uh, downturn. Um, what is it that behind the scenes, behind all the panic, what do you think is happening there with the powerful? Well, I mean, it depends on who you're talking about. But in the US, the, you know, there's a, it's a weird, we've got a weird oligarchy. Because American oligarchs legitimately believe they made it on because they deserve it. Mm. And they also don't really understand that their wealth and power is tied to the United States. So, you know, there's a Mark Zuckerberg is naive. I mean, he's reckless. He's a dangerous. You know, what he's done is very dangerous, but he's also really naive. And he doesn't really understand why he was successful. And I, I think if you look at like oligarchs in China, they're really aware of where their power comes from. They understand that they are tied to, to the Chinese state and that if the Chinese state succeeds, they succeed. And if the Chinese state doesn't, that they, then they don't. And when they have a conflict with the Chinese state, the oligarch loses. The oligarch gets put in prison or gets executed. So it's a very different mindset in China or in Russia than the oligarchy in the US. Mm our oligarchs are pretty naive about power. Um, they're not naive about power in terms of enforcing power in the United States, but what they do is they basically break the U.S. state. That's what's happened is the state, America can't govern because our oligarchs have broken our government. And now when we need a government to deal with a pandemic, to deal with China, to deal with reshoring a whole bunch of social problems, the government doesn't doesn't function right it does it doesn't you you can't take 
a, a, an expected out. You can't like, you know, you, you can't say, hey, government, do here are resources with these resources, do these things because the capacity doesn't exist because the oligarchs have made sure that that capacity doesn't exist in government. Because if it mm. did, if, if the U.S., you know, if the IRS had enough, the, the, our taxing authority had enough data and power to move money to the whole country the way that you could in, in other countries really quickly, it would also have the power to audit the rich and they don't want that. Right. That's mm. true like, across the board. If the, the, the government has the surveillance capacity and governing capacity to, to solve social problems, it also will have the governing capacity to govern the rich and the rich don't mm. want to be governed. Right. And that's the problem that we're having right now where where American oligarchs are struggling because they're like, we want to be governed. We want a government to address certain social problems, particularly China. Um, they have different ones that they want to, you know, they want the pandemic. They want somebody to deal with the pandemic. Hmm. But they also don't want the government to really wield power because if it does, then there's, that's the only potential competitor with them. So that's where they are. It's a, it, I think it's a confused moment. I mean, you see a lot of them standing with Black Lives Matter, which is very cynical, you know, Chevron stands with Black Lives Matter. Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg stand with Black Lives Matter. And it's like, you know, I mean, it, it's that's <laughs> yeah. weird, right? I mean, I, I mean, that's a weird dynamic, right? Yeah, and it's pretty transparent. I mean, uh, you know, to some people, I guess it, it's it's pretty clear to see that as soon as an issue comes along, they've got some people in the background running the numbers and saying, "Well, you, you're still going to be making money if you go on this team or if you go on that team." So, so immediately put it out and. Um, you mentioned well, Mark Zuckerberg. They want, to make sure, they want to make sure that that Black Lives Matter doesn't become a slogan for you know Black Lives and Amazon Matter, and yeah. time to break up Amazon or it's time to break up Facebook because Black Lives Matter, right? They don't want it to get there. They yeah. want it to be yes, Amazon is going to maybe do some nice things for some of its workers in its warehouses, and it's going to give some money to some of the you know civil rights groups, and you know host a conference and and that's what they want and so they're trying to figure out how to how to navigate this moment of popular outrage and not at them and this outrage is at police violence but it could very easily move towards anger with the the deeper political economy structures or it could move you know in a different direction it's it's mm. they know that yeah definitely and 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 you mentioned mark zuckerberg there's something that you've talked about a lot um, is the monopoly of Facebook. And, and you mentioned uh, in, in a talk that you gave this quote from Mark Zuckerberg where he was literally saying something that, you know, if you're attentive enough, you can probably see it already coming, um, that, that Facebook is pretty much like a government and they make decisions almost like a government. Uh, right. How soon, uh, I guess that's the wrong question, do do you think that it is moving in the direction of becoming almost like a world government, the, those giant companies? And if so, um, you know, what do you think is the effect? Uh, like, what are some of the markers? You know, is it, is it censorship? Is it, uh, what, what are these markers? Just private regulatory agencies. So, so Gov Mark Zuckerberg, you know, the quote is, in many ways, Facebook is more like a government than a business. We're really mm. setting policies. And when you have market power, it means that you govern the terms and conditions in that particular market. When you don't have market power and you operate in a market, then you have to operate under a set of terms and conditions that, is, that are set usually by public agencies. Um, so that's what a regulated market looks like. But when you're a monopolist, you set the, or, a, or an oligopoly, you, you're setting the terms yourself. So, so Mark Zuckerberg's, you know, been increasingly explicit. So he just set up a Supreme Court, right, for content moderation, which is a, a regulatory apparatus. Uh, but they mm -hmm. also have a whole set of policies that they are constantly making and refining around how they're going to do content moderation. They have a whole set of policies that they organize around advertising. So they're, they're really, what they are doing is they're governing, you know, social media, they're governing um, privacy privacy choices, they're governing elections. I mean, they have a whole election protection team. These are, these are governing choices. They're never gonna become, you know, explicitly sovereign, right? But, um, 
but that that's sovereign like power. And I think you can see that with Google and Amazon and, and, you know, a whole bunch of companies when they become big and powerful, they adopt forms that seem govern government like they have um, almost regulatory type systems. They, they impose rules and regulations, sometimes fines. Um, they, they exclude people from access to critical resources. So, I don't think we have to say when's it going to happen. I mean, it's it's already happened. Mm, yeah, you already you see Zuckerberg negotiating with with media outlets on how they can access Facebook's audience, and that's that's very much you know what a media regulator does, right? How do you access an audience? You know that that's you know it's it's Mark Zuckerberg setting the terms and conditions for how we talk about electoral matters, how we what kind of access. We, we get to media and what access those media get to audiences. He's setting privacy policies. He's setting revenue flows for advertising, um, setting, you know, social terms, you know, setting location parameter policies. I mean, there's just a lot of things that he's actually governing at this point. Hmm. And also data. I mean, let's not forget about data. There's a huge amount of, of information that exists in Facebook and in Google and in Uber that's important public data about lots of social problems and social opportunities and, you know, information, misinformation. At one point, a couple of years ago, Mark Zuckerberg was on a podcast and he said, you know, one time I learned that Americans on average have three close friends a piece. And I thought, why not see if we could get them to have four? So I tasked a team at Facebook to see if we could get people to have one more close friend. And I was, you know, I was like, that's crazy. That's like a social choice, right? Just to decide everybody's going to have one more close friend. Like that's really an intrusive governing apparatus, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we don't realize that it's happening. And yeah, that, that is genuinely horrifying that in, it, it, by the click of a finger, he could literally just start to enact a social change right. of that level. That's, that's insane. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if we have ever figured out how to do it, but it's just, it's just like one of those, like, just like the CIA never really figured out mind control, but like they, they yeah. tried, like, it's not yeah. like it didn't do damage. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I mean, the, the thousands of years that we've had, you know, governments, they've never figured out how to do it exactly right. And all yeah. of a sudden you think that just, yeah, bam, let's just try and, you know, give people an extra friend. Ah, that's, that's, but but moving to like censorship and and regulatory powers of social media platforms, this is something that's in the news at the moment. <clears throat> um, a lot of people are thinking about it. Do you think it can be done right? Do you think it should never be done, or is there somewhere in between? Uh, no, it can't be done right. But uh, the problem isn't that the problem isn't that we're not censoring properly. The problem is you have to look at. Uh, these social media platforms as public spaces that mm. have a specific network architecture. And what we should be doing is seeing them that way. So no one ever asks, what's the right way to censor a phone network, right? Because that question has never come up um, because we don't think about a phone network as a, a place of editing. We mm. think about a phone network as a communications network. And it's because I don't, you know, I don't pay, you know, Verizon or AT&T or whoever I buy telecom service from. I don't pay them based on what I say. And I don't, you know, they don't make money based on what I'm talking about. So the, the fundamental problem with social media is that they get paid based on the kind of content that people create. So the more addictive, the more divisive, the more advertising they mm. can sell against it. And so it's, it's fundamentally the, a business model problem. What we need is, is effectively platforms that are neutral, right? And that don't have an incentive to move certain kinds of incendiary content or, other, or, or downgrade other forms of content, but that just don't make money based on what kinds of content we're, we're moving, but make money by charging people for the communication service that they're providing. And if we had a, mm a business model where that was the case where people communication networks did not make money on advertising 
then we wouldn't be talking about censorship because there wouldn't be any incentive to manipulate or control what people are saying. Hmm. But if, if Facebook came out tomorrow or Twitter or anyone came out tomorrow and said, okay, we're moving to a new model. Um, listen, it's only going to cost you $1 a week to be on our platform, but still you get access to everything, you know, moving to that, you know, pay to have the, the system. Do you think people would go for that or do, or are we just addicted to that free? Like everything is free now. I don't know. I mean, I think there are different ways. I think that Facebook, if they wanted to, could transition to a paid model and it would change their business significantly. Certainly you'd mm. seen a, you'd see a substantial drop off. Um, but so what, mm. right? I mean, it, Facebook is not necessarily a good thing. It, it, it just is right. And it, and yeah. if they weren't able, I mean, that that's what price signals are good for price signals are good at getting people to explicitly commit to buying things they want and not buying things they don't want so mm. i think you know one of the things about social media is it is it's bad like social media is bad and, and it's not because it is inherently bad obviously it's a technology that i think is really exciting you know but but people over consume it and they over consume it because they're not paying directly for it. They're paying indirectly for it. If you wanted to buy access to it and you explicitly tried to buy access to it, that would be one thing. Then you would be making the choice to consume it. But right now, you know, you sit down at 8 a.m. 8 p.m. on a Saturday night. You're like, oh, let me just look at this YouTube video. And then it like the algorithm draws you. And then all of a sudden it's like 9.30 in the night, you know, and now it's like, oh, the, I kind of wasted my Saturday night, right? Hmm. That's not a choice, you know, and they, maybe Google made 30 cents on that because of the ads that you watched. Hmm. Would you pay, you know, would you be willing to pay 30 cents to um, not have wasted that time? If you had been paying YouTube and they weren't addicting you, but they were just delivering a video service, Maybe you would have set up set up your video service so you didn't have those algorithms. So you just sat down and watched the video and it was, you know, and it ended and then you went out and did what you wanted mm. to do. Like the point here is that we are paying for these these um, services, but we're just not paying directly. And so I think we're over consuming them, which isn't to say that we would we wouldn't use Facebook and Google and Twitter and these other services if we uh, if we had to pay for them, it's just that we would use them less. And that would be, I think probably, probably a good thing. It would just be a lot less polarizing. Um, mm. and they would have different incentives to their product. You know, if there was, if they, if they charged us for it and there was competition, you know, they would have to make a better product too. Cause like, remember Facebook was an awesome product when it came out in 2004, like it, there was nothing like it. It was really cool. It was clean. It was neat. And now it sucks right? Like if you go onto Facebook, it's bad. It's like a bad product, but like there's no way to move to a different social network unless everyone in your social network moves at the same time. And that's impossible. You can fix that with a whole bunch mm. of, you know, with interoperability and, you know, other forms of competitive changes to competition policy. But, um, you know, but, but if you don't, then Facebook is still going to suck and it does. Mm. And that's, and that's pretty much because they've done their, innovation on the advertising side. I mean, they try to yeah. innovate around ads and tax loopholes and, you know, stuff that's hard to do, but also stuff that's fundamentally unproductive. Hmm. And, and who in the government is pushing for these kinds of changes and is it working? Yeah. So I think that there's, you're going to see, well, so antitrust enforcers are looking at Google and Facebook. There will likely to be an antitrust case fairly soon on, against Google. You might see a case to break up Facebook to reverse its Instagram merger. I don't know. There are, there are policymakers that are looking at that. In terms of the changing from clickbait targeted ads to contextual ads, you're gonna see some members introduce bills to do that soon. <coughs> You've already seen David Cicilline introduce a bill on political ad targeting, but the underlying framework is going to be changing what's called section 230 of the telecommunications act which is the executive order trump put out last week that was really stupid um that that piece of law there's a is basically it's a government benefit to tech platforms that lets them be immune from liability for what people say on their platform so it doesn't matter what facebook 
anyone does on Facebook, Facebook's not liable for it, regardless of what mm-hmm. Facebook does. Facebook could edit it. They could put warning labels. They could incentivize it. They're not liable for it. That's, that's a government benefit. That's a subsidy. And people are going to condition that subsidy. They're going to put forward rules to condition that subsidy on whether you're targeting and tracking people to sell ads. And that's going to, I think, have a, a significant and positive effect on the, on the space. I mean, it, the, the bills are going to be introduced. We'll see, um, we'll see how long it takes to pass them. But they're pretty, the logic is pretty good. Hmm. Yeah, well, I, I hope there's something happens soon because it's it's it just seems like it's this giant wave that just keeps on building up. Every year gets crazier and crazier in the world that we live in, right? Um, something I, I, I was talking to my brother who actually lives in DC um, recently, and he was we were discussing kind of the um, uh, the strange circumstances behind labeling businesses with this COVID um, COVID outbreak labeling businesses as non-essential and services as non-essential. And meanwhile, you know, the giant companies which are deemed as essential uh, take all the business to them. It's like Amazon, you know, seeing massive increases in business during the COVID outbreak because everybody's inside ordering from Amazon. Uh, Do you think that there's any sort of, um, how, how do you look at this sort of situation where these giant monopolies are actually getting bigger and stronger as a result of all of these, uh, these social problems or the COVID outbreak? Right. So, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know what to say, except it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, we need to, we need to do something about it. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a number of things you could do. But it's just a question of like, are we have to do politics to break these guys up? Mm. So we'll yeah. see. And you know that that might be somewhere where this this was going to be my final question. I think now's a good time to ask it, which is, what can the average person do in America or even around the world, whatever you know, um, in order to uh, maybe shift whether it's their local government towards working for them, you know, to, to, from working for the people. Do you send emails? Do you send letters? Like, do you, I know you yeah. vote, obviously. Like, what, what's, what are the processes? I think, that's, I think educate yourself. I mean, my book here. Hmm. Goliath. <laughs> educate yourself. Read my book. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no. I mean, I think the most important thing to do is to educate yourself and then, you know, talk to your elected officials about monopoly power. You know, what I've found is that monopoly power is a much less polarizing problem than most of the other questions. Because, you know, what you find is that there's, there's very few people that actually think that monopoly power unregulated is a good thing. Now, they mm-hmm. disagree on how to address it sometimes, but it doesn't have that culture war aspect that a lot of our other policy questions do. Hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, I guess, I guess I only had one more question. Um, and, and this is just out of interest for myself. Um, tomorrow I've got, uh, Lawrence Lessig coming on the show as well to, um, kind of discuss politics, the elections, everything like that. Um, you know, how do you see the two party system? Do you think that we're dealing with a really old system in a modern world that simply doesn't work? Do you think that America is going to break out of the two party system soon? Or is it just uh, completely built into the system and we just have to deal with it? I don't think it's that big a deal. I mean, I know people like are like, well, you know, both parties are bought off. So we need a third party. And it's like, well, they could buy the third party. if That's true. I mean, it's not, you know, I. That's not the root of the problem. No, it's not. I think that that the you've seen similar political dysfunction all over the world. The the root of the problem, and you know, America's been had healthier politics thirty years ago when and we had a two party system then. You know, it's not the 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 our fundamental guiding ideas are broke are problematic. We've we've enabled concentrations of power everywhere, and that's a function of of just a society that doesn't that stopped understanding how to see power. It's not that we are like only have two choices and we were trapped. It's just like broadly speaking, you know, because parties are flexible. So, you know, if if people want one thing and neither party's delivering them, then the parties will compete to try to deliver that. 
and you know, so so that's. I don't think that there's a huge like missing gap in what uh, in what people want. I mean, there is in a sense in terms of concentrated corporate power, people are unhappy with that, but um, uh, but they will compete for what people want. And if people do choose, if people want to address corporate power, they will, you know, their votes will reflect that, their choices will mm. reflect that. And, you know, it's getting better. You know, there's a lot of more people that are upset with what's happening. But um, I don't ultimately think that it has to do with uh, with with two parties. In fact, I think that that's like that's a little bit, you know, philosophically, the big the biggest problem is that we think of ourselves as consumers, not citizens, right? Mm-hmm. As so we say, I want Coke, not Pepsi. And if you don't like either Coke or Pepsi, you're like, well, I want a third choice. That's a very consumer oriented way of seeing the world. Another way of seeing the world is to say, well, we've got to actually get in there and and change it. It's actually the distribution system behind the, you know whoever delivers Coke or Pepsi, yeah. the, that, that's, you know, you got to get in there and, and as a producer and rethink how production happens. So that's, that's the way I look at it. And I, I think that if we say, oh, I don't like the Democrats and Republicans, that's just Coke or Pepsi. We need a third choice. I think that's really avoiding the main, the main problem, which is just that our fellow citizens believe certain things and we have lost the ability to just do politics and solve social problems. So, mm. Yeah. Well, Matt, thank you so much for, for talking to me today. This has been enlightening and, uh, and just share with me in the audience where people can find you and, and I'll put all the links in the show notes. Great, thanks. So you can find my uh, newsletter and my book both on my website. That's M-A-T-T-S-T-O-L-L-E-R.com. That's mattstoller.com. I'm also on Twitter at, at Matthew Stoller and you can find me there. The book is called Goliath, The 100-Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. Heck yeah. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to sign up for email updates, join my Patreon meetup groups that we hold weekly, or if you'd like to offer feedback or suggestions for future guests or topics on the show, then you can head to simonjedrew.com. There you'll also find information about how we can work one-on-one together with my alignment coaching based around the philosophical principles found in Stoicism. Finally, if you are on Facebook, then I'd love to see you in our group, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But hey, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'll talk to you next time.